Hello, friends. This is Brother Wesley at First United Methodist Church, and we are gathering once again for our midweek Bible study. And we're going to uh, continue in Philippians chapter 1, picking up in verse 12. Last week, we looked at a prayer that the Apostle Paul offered on behalf of the church at Philippi. And uh, uh, I, I hope that all of us might have had our prayer lives encouraged by reading how he was praying mm -hmm. uh, for the Philippian Christians and that we might also uh, sense uh, that God has called us to be in prayer uh, for those who are following Christ, not only those who are near us, but also those who are around the world. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to continue on now, and I'm going to invite Caleb, if he will, to Lead us in prayer and to begin to read that first section. I'd be happy to. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time together, this time to dive into your word, this time to search the scriptures, this time to dive into uh, what you uh, breathed and inspired. Lord, inspire in us something new, something different, that as we uh, look at this study, as we continue in this study, our hearts are transformed, our faith is deepened, and our roots are growing uh, closer to your heart. Uh, Lord, be with us during this time and be with all those watching, however they may be watching. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> uh, we're in Philippians 1. Uh, starting in verse 12 through 14. Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. All right. So it might be helpful for us uh, as we begin this study in, or continue this study in Philippians 1, mm -hmm. uh, to remember that uh, part of Paul's time in Philippi is recorded in Acts chapter 16. Uh, two particular stories that are uh, very important uh, to the ministry of the Apostle Paul and I guess to our understanding of the ministry of the Apostle Paul, who he was, who God had called him to be uh, in, in his world, in his time, uh, you see, I think, exemplified in Acts 16 mm -hmm. in Philippi. Mm -hmm. One is the salvation of a Roman woman from Thyatira by the name of Lydia, who the scripture tells us was a uh, dealer in purple cloth, uh, which was uh, uh, particularly expensive. Mm -hmm. uh, purple was the color of royalty and uh, political elites. Mm -hmm. Not just everybody could wear a purple shirt. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we know that, that Lydia was uh, selling expensive goods, and it's actually sort of unusual. Uh, and when you think about the differences between the Roman Empire and its different provinces and uh, different culturally, mm -hmm. uh, for, uh, for instance, if you go to pa Paul's uh, part of the Roman Empire, which at the mm -hmm. time was called Palestine, uh, you didn't find women who owned businesses. Mm -hmm. there, there were none. Mm -hmm. uh, but here uh, in, in this very Greek place, mm -hmm. uh, it's not quite as unusual to find a woman who is a business owner. Uh, who is also, uh, a, a uh, in some ways, uh, connected to the worship of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, uh, but who has not yet heard the story of Jesus or become a, a born-again believer. Uh, it's there in Philippi that Paul brings Lydia to Christ, and, and she becomes an important part of the early church. Uh, that, but probably the part of that story that connects uh, most to the reading today, as we see uh, in the reading that Caleb shared with us is that Paul references once again his imprisonment mm -hmm. uh, is the fact that when Paul was in Philippi, he was in prison for a little while. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, if you, if you read Acts 16, you'll find that Paul and Silas encounter a, uh, a young woman who is demon-possessed, a slave girl who is demon-possessed, and the people who own her 
are making a profit from her because she is telling people their fortunes. And Paul, who becomes annoyed uh, with this girl mm -hmm. and this de demon that is on the inside of her, basically out of his aggravation, cast the demon out. And, uh, and, and Paul goes to prison. Of course, the people who own the young girl uh, are not impressed that their uh, psychic is no longer psychic. Mm. Uh, that being said, too, uh, if you've ever dealt with any of the uh, psychics before and you've thought that they might be saying some stuff that sounded somewhat accurate, uh, just know that within Acts 16, the powers of darkness were uh, using this young girl uh, in, in a way that appeared to be um, accurate, I guess, for the people that she was uh, uh, telling their story to. Mm -hmm. um, that being said, that's not the important part of the story. The important part of the story is that Paul and Silas wind up in prison mm -hmm. and God supernaturally causes a great earthquake that frees them and the jailer, who is a Roman soldier, uh, thinks that all of his people, all of his prisoners have escaped and wants to fall on his sword and kill himself. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess that's a better alternative than having to tell your uh, commanding officer that you, your charges have escaped from you. Mm -hmm. And Paul and Silas lead this man and his entire family to Christ. Mm -hmm. Why is that important to the story today? Paul admits in verse 12 that what has happened to him, his imprisonment, uh, has actually helped the gospel to spread in the world. Mm -hmm. And that I think that speaks a lot to um, not letting circumstances define you, not letting uh, the world and whatever you're trapped in to define uh, what God can still do. Um, because even in prison, you know, Paul had every right to just kind of give up and say, you know, um, I'm done with this, you know, I'm tired of being arrested, I'm tired of being beaten, I'm tired of, of, of doing all this work, it's too much for me, it's too much for me. But instead, he uses prison as a gateway to bring others to Christ Jesus. And that is so impactful and so powerful because it doesn't matter whether you are rich, poor, in prison, where whatever your circumstance is, you don't have to let it define you. You can still be a huge, powerful light for Jesus Christ. Wherever you are. Wherever you are. You know, one of the, the central theme, I think, of this whole text that we studied today, as we said a little bit ago before we got started, is that Paul seems to be declaring over and over and over again to the church in Philippi that this is not about him. Mm -hmm. That there is greater things that are happening. This is not about his personal comforts, mm -hmm. uh, whether he, you know, is enjoying the things that he finds himself struggling in because of the gospel, whether you're not, you know, uh, no, who, nobody wants to be in prison. Nobody wants to be a captive. No. I'm sure that prison food was even worse mm -hmm. in the first century mm -hmm. when Paul was there. I'm sure that the beds were harder if they even had beds at all. Uh, and Paul King seems to be saying over and over again, this is not about me. Instead, it's about Jesus. And you know what? The, the story you brought up before uh, of Paul being even in anger. You know, so many of us, when we're angry, we're, we don't want to go to church. It's too uh, this. It's, it's too that. You know, they, they said something about politics there, something we, we're angry about it. We could, we could easily shout. In Paul's anger, he still casts a demon out. He says, mm -hmm. Jesus is more important than my anger. Be gone, demon. And that is so powerful because so often we let our emotions dictate, once again, the, the circum our circumstances are, you know, dictate our emotions. Our emotions drive us away from Jesus. But Paul says, Jesus is bigger than my anger. Jesus is bigger than my emotions. Jesus is. Get this demon out of this girl. Even in his anger, he's doing the work of the kingdom. Even in his anger, <laughs> yeah. doing the work of the kingdom. Yeah, and part of what you see, if you look at the Acts 16 passage in verse 25, is that when Paul and Silas are in this jail, uh, is that they are praying and singing. So that even though they're in a sort of a, a, a terrible situation, a, a difficult situation, mm -hmm. they're worshiping, mm -hmm. they're praying, mm -hmm. they're, they're focusing on God. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Brother Don, anything on 
insight for us over there? I just think of that scripture verse, and all things give thanks uh, in Christ Jesus, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. In all circumstances, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And we see that here with Paul and Silas. Yes. Um, all right. So that that's the that's the first section. Um, and he also says, I think, helpful before we go to the next section and say not only has this incarceration, this imprisonment, uh, and it seems that he's probably talking about this last imprisonment that's talked about in Acts when he finally arrives in Rome and is under house arrest there. seems that's what he's talking about. But he says not only has this imprisonment uh, helped the gospel to sp spread, but it has also emboldened Christians mm -hmm. to be able to share the gospel. Mm -hmm. uh, that they are, they are taking courage and they are tenacious mm -hmm. because they see me being tenacious for the sake of the gospel and they, they are seeing me do that. Mm -hmm. So they are following in my footsteps. So, so this whole imprisonment thing is good for the sake of the kingdom. Even though it might not be good for me personally, it's good for the sake of the kingdom. Absolutely. It's uh, here in Philippians or another place, he mentions that even the Roman guards are being converted to Christ or being won over. Mm -hmm. No, it's here. No, it's here. It's here. It's here. It could very well be in these verses we just read mm -hmm. that they're coming around to and believing and trusting. Yeah, he says, verse 13, so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard mm -hmm. and to everyone else that my imprisonment is for Christ. Uh, you know, that, and that's a big, you know, when you talk about the imperial guard, uh, first of all, you're talking of the, the elite of mm -hmm. the Roman military. Mm -hmm. uh, and you're, you're talking about a lot of people uh, that have seeing this witness of Paul and believed in Christ because of it, mm -hmm. uh, which, is, which is a great statement. All right, let's, uh, let's look now at verses 15 through 18. I'll read those. It is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I am in chains. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice. Paul seems to be, uh, to me, drawing on uh, the life and the ministry of Jesus here mm -hmm. uh, as, as he uh, once again states, this is not about me. Mm -hmm. This is not about whether some preacher uh, is competing with me or there's some mm -hmm. kind of rivalry or some kind of jealousy that's going on. Mm -hmm. uh, and that happens sometimes amongst us preachers. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's not about that. It's about the gospel being spread. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to remove myself uh, and my feelings and just be thankful that they're spreading the gospel, even if their motivation's not right. Mm -hmm. But he also says that there are many people who have the right motivations mm -hmm. out of love and out of a desire to help me in this work, uh, mm -hmm. that they are preaching the gospel. And, and so Paul says both groups exist. I'm not going to get caught up in trying to figure out who's who. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's not my call. It reminded me of two passages from the gospel. One is from Mark chapter 9, verse 38, and the other is from Luke 54. Uh, you know, just to, and let me, let me just flip over here briefly and read that one from Mark chapter 9, verse 38. If my eyes can see these little bitty tiny words. <laughs> John said to him, Teacher, this is Mark 9, 38, John said to him, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. And so we see, uh, right, the disciples come across this individual who is casting out an, a demon in the name of Jesus, mm -hmm. using the authority mm -hmm. and the power that comes along with the name of Jesus. And the disciples say, he's not part of our crowd. He's not a part of our clique. He doesn't go to our Sunday school room. Mm -hmm. He doesn't sit on our pew. And Jesus says, guys, settle down. Settle down. Let God be the judge. Mm -hmm. Maybe this guy's working with us. Maybe he's on our team, you know. I mean, he is casting out demons in my name, so just, you know, back off a little bit. <laughs> uh, and then in Luke chapter 9, uh, 
where we see a similar circumstance. Um, Luke 9.54. Luke 9.54. Thank you, Caleb. Absolutely. I need all the help I can get. <laughs> you want me to read it? Yeah, I'll read it for us if you got it there. Um, Luke 9.54. When the disciples, James and John, saw this, they asked, the Lord, do you want us to call fire down from heaven to destroy them? So Jesus and his disciples are ministering in Samaria, which is the central part of Israel or central part of Palestine. Uh, again, in Paul's day, it was called it was Palestine in the, the Roman territory of um, central part of the country, mm -hmm. and uh, and they come across this Samaritan village. He was not responsive, and uh, uh, these two apostles say, you know, let's just take them out. Mm -hmm. Let's call them fire from heaven. Let's take them out. And Jesus says, no, 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 no. Would y'all quit being petty? Let God be the judge. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not your job. We don't need you to do that. I just need you to back off and, and you know, we'll go somewhere else now. Mm -hmm. We've preached here. Let's go preach somewhere else now. <clears throat> and so we see that. And we see Paul drawing, I think, on this tradition and this ministry of Jesus uh, where he says to the Philippians, and pettiness can be such a part of the church at times. Mm -hmm. Uh, where we get caught up in trying to figure out what people's motivations are. And if they're here, I, don't, I can't tell you the number of times in the 13 years of my ministry I've heard somebody say, I wonder if they're here for the right reasons. Mm. Not our call. Mm. Not our call. It belongs to God. Mm -hmm. Paul says, I am not participating in that rat race. I am just thankful that the gospel is being spread. You know, there's a quote, and so many people attribute this to Abraham Lincoln, and, he, and, it, and it's, a house divided itself uh, cannot stand. And that's not Lincoln, that's scripture. It's Jesus. That's Jesus. <laughs> and he's saying, if you start pitting yourselves against one another, if you are so focused on, if I have this many people in my congregation, I'm beating the Presbyterians, I'm having a good Sunday. Or if I have this many people in my Sunday school, I'm beating uh, the other class, and I'm going to go talk to that uh, Sunday school teacher and rub it in his face. It doesn't matter. Is the gospel being spread? Is Jesus' name being spread to the masses? Mm. Is God's kingdom the forefront of your thought, or is it the competition? Mm. Amen. Amen. Brother Don? I have nothing to add. <laughs> <laughs> that was good. So that, was, that, was, that was well covered. I can't, I can't top that. All right. Well, and again, we're not trying to talk. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, to, no topic. Live, live what you preach, dear yeah, Reverend Don, right there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> all right. Um, all right. So let's move to this third part, uh, verses 19 through 24. All right. For I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. For if I am going on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. But it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Well, the first thing that Paul says here is he knows, again, he's in prison. We think he's in Roman prison. And he says, I know deliverance will come. Deliverance will come. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that probably means more than one thing. Uh, so let's talk about that just for a second. Brother Don, I'm going to invite you, if you will, to when Paul says he knows that deliverance will come, what do you think that means? What, what does he mean when he says that? Well, I think he will either be released from prison or he will perhaps get his heart's desire and die and be with Christ. But he is willing to work and labor as long as he lives because he knows it's good for the kingdom. He's there to serve. And so whether... Alive or dead, he wants to make a witness for Christ. So he, I, I think he's prepared to die, but I think he's willing to live and wants to live to serve. So he, he knows that however it goes, God's got him covered. That's true. That whether he remains alive, mm -hmm. remains in prison, gets out and is free, 
before he dies, uh, that whatever happens, God has covered him. Mm -hmm. That he has been, as we will look at this Sunday from Revelation chapter 14, he's been washed in the blood of the Lamb. Mm -hmm. And that he is safe mm -hmm. and secure, mm -hmm. even when he's not. Mm -hmm. uh, because he knows ultimately he's in God's hands. Mm -hmm. And you don't get any safer than that, even in jail. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think there's something to be said that, you know, Paul recognizes uh, what is happening in the world. He's very aware that Christians could be executed. Christians could be uh, tortured, put to death. He's very aware of his circumstances. Mm -hmm. But he's also very aware that if he has the opportunity to live, that that life means to be free fruitful in his ministry. He can't sit still. He can't stay still. He has a meaning. There is purpose. There is a drive in him that only the Holy Spirit could have put there to continue ministry in the world. And he doesn't want the Philippians or anyone really he writes a letter to to falter in their faith because of him. If he sits there and says, oh, well, I'm sad now and my faith is wavering, that doesn't inspire the others to continue their ministry. So he's saying be fruitful. If you're going to live, live the best life you can for Jesus Christ. And I, I think the implication for the Philippians and for us as well is if you're in Christ, no matter your situation, no matter whether you're in jail or you have cancer, you're lying on your deathbed, uh, what, uh, what's going on? There's a, a, a terrible uh, relationships going on in your family and you're mm -hmm. caught in the middle of all of that. Mm -hmm. uh, I think Paul is ultimately saying to the Philippians and us too that if you're in Christ, your deliverance will come. Mm -hmm. Now, may may not come the way we expected it to come, mm -hmm. uh, but it will come. Mm -hmm. It will come. And however God delivers you, it will be good. Mm -hmm. It will be good. And almost, uh, the, so verse 21 there for, where he says, for me, for to me living is Christ and dying is gain is almost a, is almost the answer to the question because uh, he says that in, in both ways, Christ is being glorified. Mm -hmm. If I live, I will be fruitful. Mm -hmm. If I live, I will continue to encourage the Philippians and the Ephesians and all of these churches that I've been in ministry to, I will continue to encourage them. I will continue to preach the gospel. I will continue mm -hmm. to live out the gospel. And if I die, I will be joined in the very perfect, unbroken presence of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And either way, it's going to be okay. It's going to be good. Mm -hmm. So, what a beautiful passage. Uh, and there is so much encouragement in here for us. Uh, an invitation uh, I think for us to look at the big picture, mm -hmm. an invitation to see that even out of our struggles and out of our trials and our difficulties, how the gospel can be advanced. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think particularly when, when we take this approach that the Apostle Paul has where he's seeking for it to be fruitful, right? Mm -hmm. He's just not like crossed up in prison saying, you know what, I'm in prison now. I guess I can't do anything for the Lord. No, he's writing letters and sending them to folks. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you, you when you back Paul into a corner, he just keeps on doing ministry. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's I'm in a corner, but I'm gonna let's, let's just keep. We're gonna keep doing ministry now because this corner is not the end. Absolutely. Um, so we see that here, uh, and, and this not being caught up in the rat race where we're trying to figure out who is who is here for the right reasons, who's serving the church for the right reasons. Mm -hmm. Paul says. Don't engage in that. That's a waste of time. Mm -hmm. Let God be the judge. You mm -hmm. just live faithfully and, and let God be the judge on what others' people, uh, others' reasons mm -hmm. are. Paul says, that's not my fight. And then he says, my deliverance will come because for me, living is Christ and dying is gain. What a word. What a word. If that does not stir you on the inside, something needs to be Filled up with the Holy Ghost. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, really. I mean, it does. <laughs> so, amen. amen. Um, uh, Brother Don, I'm going to invite you, if you will, to close us in prayer. Almighty, eternal God, Lord of love and grace and mercy, thank you today for life and for your gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, who is true life. God, we're thankful for the study today. And we pray that these words might reach our hearts and God might feel and inspire us. 
Thank you again for Holy Spirit and your love and grace. And we go now in your peace in the holy and wonderful name of Jesus to serve in his name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for watching. Feel free to like, share, and comment. Amen. Amen.